Hello and welcome to the Miami Showband Peace Center online. We continue our series of speaking for myself. And today we're concentrating on women and women's uh, experience uh, of the troubles and their reaction to it. Uh, our two witnesses today are Pat Irvin, whose mother Kathleen was killed in the McGurk's Bar bombing, and that was in 1971. And uh, our other witness is Joe Berry, and Joe's father, Sir Anthony Berry, was, who was the deputy chief whip of the uh, Tory party, was um, killed in the Brighton bombing and that was in October the 12th, 1984. Eugene Reevy is up there in, the, in White Cross as usual and keeping an eye on things. And we've got two panelists and I'm delighted to say that we've with us today, we've got Liz Gillis, who's a teacher in Champlain College in Dublin and uh, Liz teaches history. And she's also a researcher for the History Channel in RTE. And we've got uh, Patricia McKenna, and Patricia is a former member of the European Parliament. She's a peace and human rights campaigner and also a barrister at law. You're very, very welcome. Pat, if we can uh, start with you, can you just tell us your own story, please? Yes, certainly. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me this evening. I was 14 years of age when my mother was killed. It was something that has stayed with me my whole life. You know, that night when it happened, my friend and I were walking down the street and the explosion went off and it literally pushed the two of us apart as we walked down. Now, when we got to the bottom of the street on our left of us, it was uh, a crowd from the other side. They were actually standing singing that song, Bits and Pieces. Now, when we turned to our right, we saw the, the smoke and the two of us being young and that and... We run towards it and what looked to me was like a hill, you know, a big hill. But as a closer I got, it was actually people and they were on top. But they were just in the shape of a hill. And then as you got closer again, you saw that they were moving bits and pieces down, passing one thing on from one to another. And then all of a sudden there's somebody shouted, I've got one here, I've got one here. And then the most merciful squeal came out. He had actually pulled out an arm, you know. And I remember going round because my mother and father, they had been at mass and they used to call in to a wee local shop there to get the messages. But apparently the messages weren't ready. And my daddy says, my, my mommy says, I will go on in here, sure. My da J Johnny only gets a pint, which was what he took, a pint my ma took an orange. And so I remember going about looking for them and I couldn't find them. And I run up to my grandma up in the house and as she was on her own, I says, Granny, where's my mummy and daddy? They're not here yet, she says. And I says, well, I'm away back down again. Where was that? You know, but I'll run away, I'll run. And as I went down, Father Blaney, Lord Reston was there. And he says to me, what are you doing? I says, I'm looking for my mummy and daddy. Get up home, he says you. Get up home now. Well, I mean, you did what the priest told you and went straight up. So when I went up to the house, there was a couple of people in and I didn't know. I had no idea at that time what was happening. And then the next thing was the, well, a lot of other people kept coming in. And again, I still didn't know. But my granny sent me in the kitchen. She says, away in there, she says, and make a cup of tea. And I remember when I was coming out of the kitchen with a cup of tea for the granny, I just heard them say, God help them, we children, their mother and father. And I just went numb. Everything started sort of spinning around me. Because I didn't know whether I was in a dream. I didn't know what I was listening to. I didn't know whether or not they were talking about me or Sam. But it had turned out that the both of them were there. And that when they had went in, um, Mr. and Mrs. Keenan were sitting in the wee snook. And a daddy went up and mommy sat down beside them. And he went up and got a pint of Guinness. And... He says he sat down and gave my mummy her orange and as she put it there, her head, that was it. The whole place went up, you know. But knowing that she was there, it was, I was totally numb and the fear that I felt, because I had never, I had never come across anything like this in my family before. You know, I mean, we were out playing, we'd have walked the streets, you went home, your mummy was there. 
And what was I going to do? I didn't know what I was going to do. And then the next thing was one of the uncles says that my daddy was all right and he was in hospital. So I was allowed to go to the hospital to see my daddy. And then I looked at my daddy and he had, he was all burned, you see, he, his body, he was buried underneath the rubble. And I looked at him and, it, and this man started to cry. And I looked and I said, but men don't cry. You know, I mean, that in itself, Stephen, it, it, oh my goodness, that shocked me to, it really did. But when we got out anyway, it was, it was, it was hard getting, it was as if you were in a dream the whole time. You didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't go and talk to my mommy because she wasn't there. And then knowing that my daddy had went through, I couldn't go and talk to my daddy and give him more to worry about. And when I looked at him and look at the sadness and the, oh my goodness, all the, the pain that he was going through. And I was looking at my mommy's sisters coming in. I mean, it was just, you were in a nightmare, a never ending nightmare. And then I remember when they brought the coffin home, um, Robert Brown was our local, <clears throat> local undertaker and he brought the coffin in and directly behind him was the army. And as they set my mommy's coffin down and of course the lid was on because they couldn't take the lid off and they demanded that the lid be opened. And Robert Brown I heard him say, you can't open this lid. These wee children here, their mother, you know, the state of their mother. And he stood th throwing the order at him to open the coffin. And my daddy was sitting at the corner and my daddy got up and he went over. I, I don't know what my daddy said to the army man. I don't know. But the army man turned, went out into the hallway and spoke through his walkie talkie. He came back in and he saluted my father and he says, I'm very sorry, sir. And he ordered the rest of the soldiers out. My father had been a, an, arm, an army officer in World War II in the Royal Irish Fusiliers. So whether, I don't know exactly what he says, or maybe they found out what type of a soldier he was, you know, because to be honest with you, every time anybody saw him on the road, they would have saluted him, you know. But things in the house, Marie and Bridge came home from England, Samuel was there, Marie and Bridge, God help them, they came over and they tried to do as best they could, you know, to take the place of my mommy and I would have went upstairs on my own and I had to, I had to, I'd have been sitting crying and, because I didn't want, I didn't want to go to my daddy. I was worried about my daddy. I was watching him and, and I was looking at Sam and I says, I mean, how can I tell these people how, my sisters, not how I feel? And they're probably going through the same thing as me. And then they started coming out with all these stories that it was our own people that had caused the explosion. And it had, they had said that the, there was our ones were sitting in the bar and they, they had seen somebody else that was fixing a bomb because the bomb was going to be moved from McGurk's bar into somewhere else. And you were, you were looking about you, you were looking at different people in your area and you, you, you didn't know who to talk to, you didn't know who to trust, you didn't know what to do. I'd never come across hatred or bitterness in my life. I'd never heard any, there was no bad words said in the house. So to me, this was just, it was, this was unknown territory that I was going into. You'd have been getting up in the morning and the first thought was running down to my mum. I should have had your breakfast and all made. But even, even when they were getting buried, the coffins were stoned. And they were standing at the bottom of the shankle and they're singing again, bits and pieces, bits and pieces. You know, it was as if even on that night when they were all out, it was as if they knew what was going to happen. You know, but I have to say this, Stephen, although even before the explosion an hour or two before, there, the, the place was in darkness. There wasn't a soldier about and there wasn't a heli. See, every time you turned a corner on the new Lodge Road, you bumped into a, an army, you know, walkabout, but there was none of them about. But and even on the night, but I have to say that on the night, there was actually soldiers came out of the out of their billets. And they actually threw their guns down to the side and helped the people, you know, take off the rubble and all. So I do have to say that, Stephen, and let know that some were there to help, you know, as well. 
But the stigma of that night has, you know, it has stayed with us all our lives. We have been fighting, it's 49 years now, 49 years, and is still telling lies about the bombing of McGurk's bar. He was the one that came out at the very start saying that it was an IRA drinking hole. It wasn't, it was a family run pub. He said that it was the IRA was in it and all. And even seven years after that, I mean, this was stories that was put out by the army. It was put out by the police. And to think about, you know, the police, it was just saying to Sam today, the police have never come to our door to tell us that our mother, to tell my grammy that our daughter-in-law and her son were in an explosion or were hurt in any way. They never came near us. We were taught, Samuel and I were, were terrorized and tortured whenever we went out by the army. I'd have been walking down, they'd have been saying things like me, oh, you'll probably end up like your mother, you know. I mean, it was horrendous what they were doing to us. I just wanted, I wanted to go into a corner and I just wanted to crawl up. And I thought to myself, well, if I wake up tomorrow, everything's going to be all right. It never was, Stephen. Going for jobs. Then days they were able to ask you what school you went to. And they also asked you, how is your parents? Your parents still alive. Sometimes the school didn't matter. But when they knew what happened to your mother, oh, she was killed in an explosion. What explosion? McGurk Spar, that was it. You were labelled as Republican. They even in Parliament went going through the whole time. They asked for our families to be investigated. Because the bomb of the McGurk Spar was not to be for that bar. It was to be for the Gem Bar. The gem bar was a bar that was frequented by the official IRA. The bomb to be planted there, the story the next day, was to be told that it was the provisional IRA that planted the bomb. And that was a story that was ready. But because they couldn't plant the bomb at the gem bar of the men outside it, they put it outside McGurk's bar. And the story the next day was they blew themselves up. And that Stephen has stuck with us for 49 years, even though we have unequivocally proved the innocence of our loved ones. And a man, a self-confessed member of the UVF, was arrested and charged with the murder. So my, this has followed me all my life. And for going back in and out of court, I never forget the day, I'll always be 14, Stephen. Always will be. I just want truth and justice. That's all I want. I don't want anybody to spend time in jail. There's no point in that. But I need to know the truth. And I want to know why they're hiding it from us. Because we know there was a collusion and cover-up and conspiracy in the murder of our loved ones. And we just want the truth. That's all, Stephen. Well, that's um, it's a very harrowing story, Pat. It's... um. It beggars belief that somebody was convicted uh, uh, for this, and even even still, they won't um, uh, admit that this was uh, had nothing to do with the people that frequented that that part, your your pub. Um, uh, we'll move on to to Joe Berry. Uh, Joe, um, you also lost a parent, and uh, can you tell us about that, please? Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me and I feel very moved by, by your story, Pat, and I'm so aware that that my story was a one-off and I live in peacetime and just realise how, how different the experience is. So um, back in 1984, uh, I was 27 and about to travel to Africa. Um, I packed my rucksack and I was off on my, my adventures. Um, and I woke up to the news that a, a bomb had gone off at a hotel in Brighton. And um, I was pretty sure that it was the hotel that my dad and stepmother was staying. And I rang up my brother who was living in Brighton at the time and he went and had a look at the hotel and tried to find my dad and, and his wife. And he kept on ringing back and saying, um, I've got there, but there's chaos, there's people in pajamas, there's blood everywhere. And the room that um, he was staying in doesn't exist anymore. And then he eventually went to the hospital and found um, my stepmother there injured. 
and at one point um i was i'm watching the morning tv with my sister and we see a policeman holding um my my stepmother's dogs saying we don't know who these dogs belong to so we rang up and said that they they belong to my stepmother and just waiting waiting and eventually about three in the morning we heard that my brother had used his signet ring um which was the same signet ring my dad had to identify his body um as soon as uh, we heard that he was dead we um had to drive to two schools to pick up my little brother and sister um, they're my half brother and half sister and they, they were teenagers and I remember um, going to the first school and my brother that he once we told him um, he he just shut down and didn't say a word and then we went to the next school for his sister and we were I remember we told her in the courtyard outside the school there was no private place to go and I keep on meeting children who are at that school who remember the moment because she just screamed. She screamed nonstop um, and she screamed the whole way back to London and we took them to their aunt. And I think it was the sense of knowing that what I was going to say to them was going to affect their lives forever. But of course it affected me as well. And I remember walking um, before I went in the car to pick them up. I remember walking in the streets of London and just trying to, get in my head that my dad was dead going my dad's dead my dad's dead and there were two guys up a building um, and they yelled down come on give us a smile it can't be that bad and i just shouted up um yeah it, it is my dad's just being killed and it's like you say pat it was a complete dream you know the first few days and we had to organize um the funeral there were lots of difficult logistics with my father being a politician and and the, Margaret Thatcher wanting to be there and us refusing to and the problems with the press um, but the whole family came together they came from all over my mother was actually um, recovering from her brother's suicide um, in Africa and she didn't come back and out of all of that I had a quiet moment in London so I guess the person I already had been influenced this, I was someone who really believed in um, in inner peace and meditation. But of course, this didn't help with the, the pain of, of what had happened. But I went somewhere in London and I, and I decided that I was going to bring something positive out of this. And that I felt like my heart was now open to the reality of war and conflict. Well, before I, I felt very detached from what was going on in Northern Ireland. And I'm, I'm really sorry about that. But I I just I was just attached with everything and suddenly I'm I'm not I'm in it and I can feel the pain I just wanted the pain to stop for everyone and I suddenly feel I'm I'm part of what's going on so I made a decision to bring something positive out of it and bring some peace and some meaning and that actually took me to um, to Belfast in 85 and um, I, I spent quite a lot of time in Belfast in 85 to 86 and went to Armagh went to many places and I was just wandering around meeting people trying to hear stories and trying to make sense of it and also trying to trying to see what I could do to make a difference you know and in those days I would talk about forgiveness very easily but it's not a word I like to use anymore and I just think I was a young this young woman who, who liked the worst thing had happened and there I was trying to find answers I met someone very high, high up in Sinn Féin in secret in Dublin and it was all part of trying to rehumanize the other and get some kind of, uh, not closure, that's not possible, but just some, some sense of what it was all about um, and how I could help. I felt really responsible as well. Um, at that time, we were offered no, no counseling, no support, nothing. Um, and I was, not, um, I was not able to deal with the emotion. I remember one day sitting in my, li my little mini and in London I've gone back to my house my home and the people who lived there refused to move out because i would let it to them for a, a year because I was going traveling so I went I was in my car and I remember just the pain and just crying crying and then I thought mm -hmm. I can't cope with this pain it's too much and I, I didn't know what to do so I, I suppressed it and and within half an hour I went to borrow um, a funeral um, dress from a friend of mine and she didn't even know like I didn't tell anyone the kind of pain I was in um so that that pain that I hid took a long time and and actually 
it's now I'm finally having trauma therapy. Um, I finally got um, access to it. So it's, that's taken a long time. But um, along the way, there have been amazing healing moments and transformational moments. And um, one of the things that changed my life was going to Glen Cree in 2000. And there was a um, victim's weekends and residential. And we went there and shared our stories. And the first time I remember meeting people who wouldn't say to me, oh, surely you've, you've let go by now. Or, you know, mm -hmm. try to... <laughs> and, no one was, I didn't feel anyone was scared of my pain there because we, we'd all had it. It was like, didn't matter who killed our loved ones. It's the same pain. And so that was very powerful time um, going to Glen Quarry. And then I decided to meet. Um, so I do have justice in a way because one person was um, imprisoned for planting the bomb. And I decided to meet him back in 2000. I mean, this is a very long story, but I'm just going to very briefly say that. So it's been 20 years since I've, I've been... Um, working in dialogue with Patrick McGee. And it's had its moments of huge challenge. It, it's also really moved me. What I can say is that, that um, when he met me, he didn't, it hadn't occurred to him that he killed a human being because he so demonized the people in the building. And I think that's the nature of people who use bombs and kill. They don't, they completely take the humanity away. And now he knows he killed a wonderful human being because he knows my dad through me. And that means, in a way, that's another kind of justice. It's like a just, it's kind of more like a um, restorative justice. And now he, he, he takes responsibility for that. Um, and that does mean a lot to me. And when I think about the young me wanted to, wanting to bring something positive. So now my, my work's gone well beyond working with Patrick McGee. I've, I've been in many places around the world and developed workshops. And I really believe that everyone has a story and we can listen to everyone's story and how and when Patrick said he could have sat down and had a cup of tea with my dad like the to me the tragedy is that people weren't having those cups of tea you know they were using violence rather than dialogue so my work is about let's not demonize people and let's listen because the sad thing is from what I know from around the world most people don't get justice you know I met people in Bosnia or Rwanda they, they don't have bodies they don't have justice I feel lucky Mine was a one-off event. I got justice. Um, in some ways, I'm I'm really lucky, but also it has affected my life, and you know it still does. Uh, Patricia, you've listened to uh, listened to the testimonies of 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 Joe and Pat. There, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think they both come from a very different perspective um, and very different experience. But I think one of the things, and it was actually what Joe said, really brings it home. And the vast majority of people around the world have no understanding of how war dehumanizes people and makes the situation dehumanized. It means that people are worth nothing. And I think when somebody experiences something like this, like it's, I, I got that feeling from what Joe was saying that suddenly it, is brought home to people that watching a news item on the television, just even today, you know, in relation to war, that those men, women and children lying there in that bomb or whatever it may be, whether it's by the West or wherever it is, they're actually like me because I've just lost someone. So it's this whole thing that those who, who whether it be state, uh, and I call it all terrorism, I have to say, whether it's state terrorism, or the other type of terrorism, as in the IRA, there is no difference because at the end of the day, they're killing people. And like when we even think, because I think Joe said that she hadn't let go yet, you know, or whatever. And like even for myself, you know, both my parents have died. Like grief is a terrible thing, death is terrible. But when your death is from natural causes, that's one thing. And even at that, you're still not able to, to kind of come to terms with it. You do to a certain extent, but to think that your loved one's life was robbed from them by a violent and senseless act, and an act to a certain extent that has been fueled by propaganda from whichever source it may come from, to make the person responsible for that think that these, you know, they're not human or somehow that somehow they demonize them to such an extent that they don't actually realize that these are real people. And I think it was Joe said there about where she met the per one of the perpetrators and it's, you know, eventually through time, it comes home to them. Look, what you did was you killed a person that a human being, you know, that you thought didn't even consider that fact that they were a human being at the time, you know, but at the end of the day, 
it's the it's ordinary people like politicians join political parties that are elected to parliament or whatever but they're not signing their own death warrant by doing that and for you know an organization to basically target them as legitimate and regardless of what you know what other casualties come about you know we have to try and get that across and then as from this the point of view of pat like the situation and i suppose for a lot of people they don't realize this but the situation in Northern Ireland, it had become, it, and it still is to a certain extent, this dehumanizing and this, uh, I suppose to a certain extent, brainwashing of people. And it's still going on to this day in Northern Ireland where from both sides, there is this somehow, you know, belief that those on the other side are somehow less human or they're not to be trusted or whatever it may be. And people instill this for political gains, I have to say. I mean, the, the, the sectarianism was fueled and fed to support political agendas. And it's horrible to think that the end result was that. One of the things Pat said, which was interesting was, about the fact that the, the McGurk's bar, bar bombing, the, the, the understanding afterwards that was that it was carried out by the IRA. Now, I grew up in Monaghan, and in 1974, on the 17th of May 1974, uh, Monaghan was blown to pieces by what was then known as the Dublin Monaghan bombings. It was the biggest mass murder in the history of the Irish state. And... Um, after that, we all in Monaghan were told and led to believe that it was by the IRA. Now, we've since come to believe that it was British intelligence that were behind it, uh, assisted by uh, some loyalist paramilitaries. But what was interesting was that this was kind of what people were led to believe. So therefore, the pressure to a certain extent to get to the truth, you know, wasn't really extended to an effective uh, end result. And the, I think in relation to investigations, there seems to be a fear by the state to properly investigate because they almost don't want to be held accountable because if they're held accountable, they're afraid of being held liable. Like I think what, and what the vast majority of people want is disclosure. They want to basically close this and try and move on. They want the truth out warts and all. It's not about compensation. And that's what I think is the excuse that's used to try and withhold the truth from the victims is about the fact that, oh, well, this will open a floodgate if we give the truth on all that has happened, because what's going to happen in the end is that the victims' families are going to be suing states and governments for compensation. And that seems to be the excuse that's very effectively used instead of saying, well, look, hold on here. These people have a right to know what happened. You know, if you go into a hospital and there's a, an accident, you know, the, the hospital mess up, you have a right to have an inquiry into how your loved one died. But if they died through uh, this kind of illegal activity, there doesn't seem to be any dis any closure for the victims' families. And it's it's just not acceptable. Liz, Liz you know, what, what seems to come out of this, what, uh, uh, from what I've heard now, is the fact that we need truth, we... Um, we need uh, we can't tell people just move on because it's not about it's not about Joe or it's not about Pat or it's not about me or Eugene or Joe Campbell or any of these people really anymore. You know, they're hardly going to shoot us again. Uh, it's it's about the children. And I often say that if uh, you're a teacher, so I often say that unless we deal with the past, it's like uh, um, leaving a, a burning building to your, to your children in, in your will. Leave the, um, it has to be addressed. Um, so how, are you, how do you approach that with regard to education? You teach history. I'm very shielded from the events that happened in the North, and I'm learning the truth of what actually happened by researching, by talking to people. Um, and the version that you're given grown up um, is different to the truth um, that is emerging or that was always known. And I, uh, what I try to do then as a teacher um, is to give that experience because it's the future that we, are, we have to be responsible for. Um, we can't be responsible for the past. Um, what our responsibility now is to try and ensure that that cannot happen again and that is true education given both sides and um, as as both uh, women and i think well uh, patricia said there 
Um, in terms of independent investigations or investigations, people don't necessarily want compensation. It's just the truth of what happened. And people know the truth of what happened, but to get it out there publicly. So that can it can be put out there, um, warts and all, and that people can just see and hopefully learn from that. Um, I, every time I meet a, a person um, who was affected by events that happened in Belfast or Map, and um, be they, you know, people who were actively involved or victims who had nothing to do with it, it, it just it affects you so much in a personal way. And you thank God that, Jesus Christ, that wasn't you. Um, it wasn't your family member. You realize how lucky you are. But what I feel that we have to do is to talk to as many people as possible if they're willing to share those stories with us, if they're willing to trust us with those stories and to try and share them to as many people as possible. Get these stories out. Um, the students I teach are American and they met yourself, Stephen. And that was the, the I don't want to use the word highlight, but that was the most rewarding experience of their uh, class with me was to meet you because they had come to Ireland with this whole, you know, perception of what had happened in the North. They hadn't a clue, but by talking to you, by going to the places, it opened up their eyes completely. And they then went and, and told their parents because their parents would have grown up in the 70s. So they, and a lot of them were Irish American. So they had this romantic idea of what uh, was happening in, in Ireland. Um, you know, that the fight was a romantic fight, that there were sort of no victims, if you know what I mean. But for them to actually meet you, to meet a person who was there, who survived, but the tremendous loss that you suffered um, and are living with, as all of the people affected by the events um, at that time were, that just opened up their eyes completely and gave them a new perspective, an honest perspective, um, and one that they come to um, themselves, not through, you know, uh, both sides, you know, fighting their corner or, you know, telling their version of events. Um, and I think that is our responsibility. It's, it's the least we can do is to try and get the truth out there and help the relatives and the victims get the truth out there finally. Um, as Patricia said, governments are still hiding things, um, they're trying to hide, even though they're well known. Um, but to make governments actually say, come on, yes, it's the least we can do to these people because it's as, been, as a result of our policies that these things happen. So education, there's, there's a great burden on, on, the, uh, on the education system to tell the truth. How, uh, how dangerous is the truth? Is the truth dangerous? Could it destabilize uh, the peace process? What do you think? Um, I don't think actually. I think I think actually having the truth out there, because both sides, you know, everyone did things that you know neither side is proud of, um, and to get it all out there, at least then nothing can be hidden, and you can you can finally start to try and address the issues but I think it's more dangerous to not have the truth because at least if the truth is there you can start to deal with the trauma to deal with to get some answers to your questions whereas if that information is hidden um or certain aspects of the stories are given um are, are drip fed to the people people are always going to be saying you know what you're hiding and that then creates more mistrust Whereas at least if the truth is out there, you can begin to build trust, um, which it's, a, it's known saying it's a, you know, it's a quick fix. It's a long, long process. But the quicker we get that journey begun, we can then actually maybe reach a, a stage where we can try and assure that it can't happen again. Because as long as we're hiding things, it can always happen again. I remember Eugene's mother uh, being able to disarm uh, um, a group that uh, arrived on the scene. I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, Eugene, that somebody came along, saw it as a recruiting opportunity uh, when she saw these people arri uh, arriving. What did she do? Uh, I suppose people that was, that was on the wrong side of this story thought that, they would, that after the murder of my three brothers, the, that the young people in the area would be ripe for recruitment and uh, it was supposed to be a meeting held and 
Mr. Shushni one was coming and Mr. Shushni one was coming and there was about maybe uh, over a hundred young fellas guys and my mother went over with a neighbour and she said while they were while they were waiting that they would that they would say a decade of the rosary for peace in the parish and peace in Ireland. And when the men arrived in their big fancy Jeep 15 minutes later, everybody was on their knees praying. So uh, they had to turn around and leave. And I would say like that, just that simple thing that was in there, like saved an awful lot of people from, you know, um, from, from um, uh, having their lives impacted by violence and God knows what they would have had to do, you know? Now, we talk about, <clears throat> We talk about getting the truth and that people aren't interested in compensation. Now I have to address that because all my life, all I was looking for was the truth. Nothing else mattered to me. But since, since I've been trying to get into court is 20 years, I've been messed about with the, with the RUC, PSNI, and uh, the whole legal system is weighted against you. Yeah. And the delays and everything, it has made me angry. And I'll, I'll tell you something, whatever our solicitors can take from them, I will <laughs> gladly take it. Now, I, think, I think Eugene, Pat said something as well uh, with regard to that, with uh, that opportunities you didn't get an opportunity because of who you were um, and when they asked you about your parents and they discovered mm -hmm. that they were part of 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 the the, the bombing that had been yeah. leveled, leveled against your community uh Joe, no matter what you say your pro your life would have gone in a different direction you would have had time to to develop a, a career or whatever it was a successful life I, I, I know that too, uh, that, they, that um, all of these opportunities are taken away from you. So I think, I, I really believe that, that what Eugene says there, even today we've got politicians who are denying the victim's pension. We had some guests on, uh, on one of our, our events just uh, yesterday or the day before, um, uh, Jennifer McNairn. And Jennifer, Jennifer lost uh, in the Abercorn bombing. She lost both her legs. And her sister, Rosaline, lost both her legs. She lost her arm and an eye. Oh, now, you know, how dare anybody say to them that, you know, even though there's a league, le uh, this thing has been passed legally in the House of Commons and that they're being refused that. It just means that the suffering of the victims goes on and on and it continues and that nobody cares about them. Deserve. Anybody that could that could take a pension away from a woman that lost her two legs, her arm, and her eye. Like, it doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. Uh, could I just come in here? Just uh, There's a few d different issues probably that are getting mixed up here. Uh, just in relation to compensation, like the, the, in relation to what I was saying, uh, what I was saying there was that the, the main motivation for investigation and to get the truth was not uh, fueled by the want for for compensation, but actually to know why people died and you know what was who was behind them, the full truth. Now, when it comes to other issues that Eugene have has rightly mentioned in relation to uh, pensions, etc., whatever it may be, this is a failure again by the state, which actually just doubly increases the injury oh, that sure. people have suffered. And then, thirdly, in relation to legal challenges, like. It really is galling to think that the state has failed people. It has been to a certain, sometimes just openly, as far as a lot of us can see, responsible for deaths or inadvertently responsible for deaths or responsible for deaths by failure to either investigate or to protect. But on the other hand, then when it comes, and that's the state with our taxpayers' money. And then on top of that, the state then can go in and fight for as long as it wants in the courts, because there is never a risk for the state that we're going to be landed with a huge legal bill if we lose our challenge. Whereas for the person on the other side, there is always the risk of, if, if you fail in a legal challenge, of the costs, not only of your own costs, but of the other side. So while the state and the state services and the state's 
um, the higher echelons can actually rely on the taxpayers' money to fund the bills in relation to challenging all the way and making it impossible in the courts. This other side, the ones that legitimately and have the right to truth and justice are being denied that with their own money being used against them and with the threat that if they pursue things in the court, then they're left with a huge financial bill to pay not just their own, but the states. Liz, you're a historian. Do you think uh, um, that women have a role that has yet to be yet to be realized in the uh, uh, in, in the solution to this, because we can't go on uh, without reconciliation. If we do, there's no hope for, especially for the North, there's no hope, there'll be no inward investment, there'll be no, uh, no, no future for the, for the young people. So what do you think the role of women uh, is, or uh, is there something specific that they can do? I, I think sort of in, in history, you know, there has, this role has been defined by women as, you know, being murderers and so on. But if you look at conflict, it is women and children that are the, the, the victims. Um, they are the ones that have to live with the, you know, the sort of reality of the events. Um, but you also find, or you have found, that it's women that are the, the loudest voice for change because they're seeing the, the everyday um, realities of the conflict and, um, you know, losing children, losing husbands. Now, and that's not to take away from, um, you know, the, the, the men because they're suffering, they have suffered just as much. But in terms of wars and so on, it's generally men that were doing the fighting. Um, but if you, certainly in relation to, to um, the, the troubles, like look at the mothers, Look at the impact that the mothers had in trying to find a solution because they were not willing to let their kids be victims or be perpetrators. Um, and their voice is and should be heard. Um, I just don't know why they're, they're not listened to by the politicians um, because theirs is the real truth, it's the real story. And they're giving voice to those who cannot speak. Um, and also, I suppose, in, 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 in bringing together, getting people together and willing to make that, take that step to maybe talk to the other side because they realize they do have a lot of things in common. We're all, you know, their mothers, their sisters, and maybe they're, they're willing to take that step forced to reach out um, to the other side and find a solution. Um, but women definitely have a vital role in all of this. It, it is, it, it's, we're doing a disservice if women are not listened to um, and are not taken seriously um, because without them, we're never going to get to, to a solution um, and it, it, they sh it shouldn't be ignored. Um, and I don't think the women, the thing is with the women is that although they may, they try to silence them, the women refuse to be silenced. They're still fighting the fight and um, just not through violence, uh, through other means. You know. When we started off tonight, uh, we started off uh, talking about two specific uh, victims, Kathleen Irvine, and, uh, who was killed in Regorgs, and also Anthony Berry. But when, when I listened to this, uh, to, to this discussion, I mean, there are other victims here as well. Uh, Joe Berry's a victim. Without a shadow of a doubt, Pat Irvine is a victim. You know, we're, we're inclined to think, well, the victims of, of McGurk's Bar, the victims of Brighton bombing, uh, were the people who were killed or badly injured. But it's the families and those who have to continue and fight. And as I've often said, you don't have to die to lose your life. And in the case of all of the, the vast majority of the victims that I, that I know and that Eugene and I and work with through TARP, um, their lives have been just taken away from them and they've been set on this path that that nothing else matters and once you get into it and and, and, and you get it, you become engaged with it it you there isn't time for anything else there isn't an opportunity to do anything else you there's this stigma i remember when when it happened to us i was 24 years of age i was never seen as a musician again people saw me as some sort of uh, uh well i suppose a victim is the right word for it but so 
when people engage with violence or, or, or accept violence or even support violence as a political expedient or as some way of changing society, once they go down that path, they're destroying more, more than the lives that they blow up in a hotel or that they kill in, 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 in with people out for a social evening. It's been fascinating listening to you and um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that we'll, we'll have uh, many more contributions from, from great women like yourselves. So I want to thank uh, Pat and Joe very much and also Liz and Patricia for, for giving us a, a really very va valuable and uh, unique insight into this. And um, I hope I hope we'll we'll stay in touch and, and, and we'll see how this develops.